Okay, uh, let's uh, get started with uh, today's uh, uh, distinguished uh, lecture in uh, the Institute of uh, Applied Computational Science. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, uh, uh, Lois uh, Martinez. Uh, and uh, I'm doing that in the place of uh, Professor Petros Kumitsakos, who is uh, wandering around uh, the airport in Houston, trying to find a quiet place to uh, watch the seminar. So, uh, uh, so uh, a little bit about uh, Lois's uh, uh, background. Uh, she uh, actually was trained in uh, mathematics and physics. She has a bachelor's degree in math and physics. Uh, and then uh, got her PhD in applied mathematics uh, at the University of Virginia. Uh, and uh, then for a long uh, uh, period of uh, time, she has been in at Argonne National Lab, where she is currently the senior computational scientist, the uh, R&D leader, uh, and the Argonne Distinguished Fellow in Mathematics and Computer Science. So, uh, uh, I have a few more things that like I'd like to mention about uh, the interests uh, of Lois. Uh, so her research focuses on uh, high performance computational science with emphasis on scalable numerical libraries and community collaboration toward productive and sustainable software ec ecosystems. She co-leads the IDEAS Scientific Software Productivity Project, which focuses on improving software productivity and sustainability as a key aspect of advancing scientific productivity. Lois is a SIAM fellow and serves on uh, SIAM Council. She serves as the chair of the SIAM Activity Group on Supercomputing. And she has received a number of awards, including the uh, uh, SIAM ACM Prize in uh, Computational Science and Engineering, uh, the R&D 100 Award, uh, and uh, she also received the Lawrence Award in 2011 for outstanding contributions in R&D, supporting the U.S. Department of Energy. We're very happy that she could join us uh, today to give a presentation as IACS Distinguished Lecturer. Lois, the floor, or uh, rather the screen, is yours. Thank you so much. It is indeed a pleasure to be, be here today with you. and. Uh, I look forward to, to sharing some ideas with you and uh, having, having a, an informal conversation. So I encourage you throughout the, the talk to don't hesitate to uh, ask questions. And I'd love to, um, to just have this be informal conversation. Today, I'm going to talk about scientific software ecosystems and communities, uh, why we all need them and, and the roles that each of us can play to help them thrive. I'll be speaking about work uh, by myself and colleagues in the Department of Energy's Exascale Computing Project. Uh, I'll introduce more about that uh, in, in forthcoming slides, but here you can see just some of the science areas and applications that are being pursued within this, this broad collaborative project, uh, applications that, that cross energy, economics, uh, earth systems, healthcare, national, national security, and more. Um, so, I'm excited to speak with you about work that is happening across the, the DOE lab community. I, as, uh, as mentioned, I work at Argonne National Lab, which is, which is a research lab located near Chicago, funded by the Department of Energy. This map shows the, the set of uh, other research labs funded by the Department of Energy as well. And the work that we're doing within the Exascale Computing Project is a collaboration across these teams and also with uh, some partners at academic institutions and universities. So the overall mission of the Department of Energy is to help ensure uh, security and prosperity by addressing issues in energy environments uh, and science broadly. So, so this picture shows the, the range of multi-program labs, Department of Energy labs around the, the outer part and uh, single program labs in the, in the inner part. Uh, Ar Argonne, where I work, is a multi-program lab. Uh, so there's research that, that's happening in uh, not only math and computer science, my, my area, but, but many other areas as well. Today, what I'll focus on is the importance of software 
as the foundation for sustained collaboration and discovery in high performance scientific computing. By this, I mean computational science and engineering, data science, uh, machine learning, AI, also infrastructure. These are all important areas of discovery where software is the key means by which we encapsulate expert expertise and thus can help to collaborate across disciplines. The diagram shown on this page was, was created as part of uh, a review article published in 2018 in SIAM Review. This was led by the officers of the SIAM Activity Group on Computational Science and Engineering. And this diagram shows uh, some of the stages of of work in computational science where we transition uh, through mathematical and algorithmic models uh, to computing models, simulation, experiments, and analysis. And of course, throughout all of this, software is the way that we're doing, doing our work. So now uh, I'd like to ask each of you to think about the, the relationships and roles that you have with software. So uh, if any of these resonates with you, uh, please raise your hands <laughs> or just think about this. So do any of you develop software that, that either you use yourself or provide to others, perhaps in your research group or the broader community? Do you use software that other people develop in your own work? Do you in some other ways contribute to teams who are developing and using software? Lots of important work is related to strategic planning, logistics, raising funds. Uh, all of that of course is necessary in order for people to develop scientific software? Uh, do you lead projects or organizations where teams develop and use software? Uh, perhaps you're a stakeholder or a supporter of projects that develop and use software. Uh, and finally, I would say, hopefully we all fit in this final category. Are you a fan of, of scientific software? Um, as we've seen, scientific software is used in so many, so many ways throughout, throughout our work. Uh, it's becoming more, more important and useful to think about these relationships among software in a more deliberate way. The slide here shows uh, illustrations of ecosystems. Uh, we can think of an ecosystem as a group of independent but interrelated elements that comprise a unified whole. And the relationships among the elements are, are what enables the ecosystem to function and in some cases to, fr to thrive. Diversity is, is quite important for ecosystems. And uh, in particular, no, no element of an ecosystem functions by itself. Uh, all the elements fulfill unique roles and the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So shown here are ecosystems from the uh, body's human gut bacteria and also the, the Great Barrier Reef uh, in Australia. What we haven't always been, been thinking about necessarily is how software can be considered an ecosystem. And today I'll talk about how, how I believe and many of my collaborators believe that this perspective is really important in order for us to be able to address next generation computational science challenges. So today I'll talk about complex complexities of, of scientific software challenges, both on the technical side and the, and the sociological side talk about some community efforts that are underway to help improve software sustainability and change research culture. And I'll talk about some work that we're doing to build a software ecosystem, especially for extreme scale science. And we believe this is, is quite important in order both to reduce risk in, in what we're doing and also to provide a, a firmer foundation for the work that we're doing in, in computational science. I like, of course, to acknowledge my many wonderful collaborators uh, who I'm working with now and also people I've been working with throughout my career. Um, I have been fortunate to collaborate throughout uh, my career with, with many people, not, not only in the, the Department of Energy uh, lab system that are gone in other labs, but also in the broader community, including the, the SIAM community, especially the SIAM activity groups for computational science and engineering, and also uh, the SIAM activity group for supercomputing. Uh, as I proceed through this talk, uh, I'll mention more about some of the projects uh, whose, whose logos are represented here. Um, I'm, I'm grateful though to, uh, 
to the, the sponsors uh, and the leaders of the Exascale Computing Project for their support of, of this work. What I'll talk about represents the combined contributions of many people, uh, certainly not just my own work, but, I'm, but I am honored to speak in behalf of this, this broad team. The Exascale Computing Project is one part of the broader Exascale Computing Initiative which is sponsored by the Department of Energy's Office of Science and also the National Nuclear Security Administration. And the, the focus of the Exascale Computing Project uh, and, and the ECI is to accelerate research and development uh, toward capable Exascale Computing and to apply this on applications of importance throughout the Department of Energy. So this is a, a multi-year project that began in 2016. The, on the right side, you can see the logos of the six lead uh, laboratories or the core laboratories. But in addition to those labs, staff from most of the other national laboratories are also participating as well as partners at various universities. So we have um, over 80 R&D teams who are working across applications and software technologies as well as in hard, hardware and integration. This slide shows the holistic approach that we consider across the project, where we're working to develop performant software technologies and applications at scale. Uh, so uh, uh, you can see here that we have areas focused on, on applications, in particular 24 applications that span a variety of areas, uh, six uh, co-design centers that are, that are working on some uh, elements that, that are synergistic between applications and software technologies. Uh, we have a portfolio of software technologies that are working to, to provide functionality across the entire software stack as needed to support these applications. I serve as deputy director of software technology in partnership with Mike Haru, who is, who is the director. And uh, we also are working on elements of hardware and integration where uh, the, the hardware and integration team are collaborating with the computing facilities for fielding our new systems uh, and helping us to make sure that all our software products are ready for use by application teams. This slide shows uh, a bit more detail of the kinds of applications that are being pursued within the Exascale Computing Project. Um, in, in my presentation today, I won't have time to go into depth on any single one of these, but I encourage any of you who might be interested in, in these areas to uh, peruse the ECP website and feel free to, to look for more information about, about each of these. They're all uh, tackling incredibly exciting science challenges and uh, working to address new, new, new discoveries by, by leveraging the new and emerging computing technologies. This slide shows a roadmap of computer systems um, spreading throughout uh, time when we began considering this endeavor to, to where we are now. Um, the teams working in the Exascale Computing Project are now very enthused to begin transitioning the, the work that we've been doing throughout a number of years onto these newly arriving systems, uh, Frontier uh, and Aurora in particular, uh, as marked on the right-hand side of this, uh, this graph. Uh, I will talk a bit about what, what that is entailing and, and what the, the systems, systems are, are, are like. A key element of, of the work that we're doing is transitioning our software and, app and applications to exploit accelerated node computing. That is, we're designing and deploying our software that exploits these, these new architectures uh, that use accelerators. And we're, we're doing this in a way that enables our, our software and applications to function not only now and today, but also to work toward, toward the future. So we're trying to do this in a way that is thoughtful for the long term. The, the diagram on this slide shows how we have been transitioning as a community over time from architectures that were CPU only on the left side of the diagram through subsequent phases that incorporate GPUs, uh, multiple GPUs, and, and what we're dealing with right now are diverse architectures that have 
not just single uh, vendors for GP GPUs, but a variety of different vendors. And so this has been um, an exciting time, but also a challenging time of transition. Uh, prior to this current era, we've had maybe 20 years or so of relatively stable programming models using the message passing interface MPI um, as our primary mode of, of using high performance architectures. And now as we're transitioning to fully exploit these heterogeneous architectures, there's a lot of challenges that we're tackling in terms of exploring new programming models and, and changing how we're dealing with our software. So of course, while we're, we're doing this work, we are addressing a variety of challenges uh, in scientific software. The, the right side of this slide shows scientific software challenges as articulated by Dan Katz in a presentation a few years ago. What we can see is that the challenges uh, are both technical and uh, people oriented, and they're all intertwined. Uh, and, and moreover, as shown on the left side of this slide, the challenges get more, more extreme as we scale the complexity of, of what we're doing. So as we scale the size of the computers that we're using, as we scale the size of the particular teams or collaborating teams developing the software, and likewise, as we scale problem complexity and software lifetime, all of these challenges uh, just get, get even harder. So what I'll talk about now are some some ways that our communities are beginning to address technical challenges. Uh, these are particularly difficult in a research context where our requirements change as our knowledge grows. And of course, we're always working with floating point software, floating point representation, which is complicated. And we want to have uh, reproducible, trustworthy science. Uh, also, the fact that we're doing this not as just single individuals, but collaborating as teams, often across disciplines, leads to sociological challenges where we have limited resources and competing priorities and incentives. All of these, these challenges lead us to often grapple with uh, technical debt, which is uh, a word used to describe the, the cost, the implied cost of additional work that may be needed um, in the future caused by choosing a, a limited solution at some point, but rather than what might be a better approach over the long term. There are a number of organizations throughout the world who have been uh, trying to address some of these challenges. And I would say, especially within the last five years or so, there's really been a, a, a quite an emphasis on on the growth of the impact and the work of these organizations. I would encourage you to explore the, each of these uh, if, if you haven't had a chance to learn about them. Um, I provided a PDF file of my slides um, to, to Jackie and uh, the, the items listed here with red underlines are all hyperlinks. So if any of you would like to access those slides, you can very easily click to find these institutions and, and the resources that they're providing. I'd like to in particular mention the, the research software engineering movement, uh, often known as RSEs, which has really been growing quite a bit in recent years. And that's, that's pointing out the importance of trained people who are experts in software, who are working as part of our science and math teams uh, on, on building high quality, robust, sustainable software. I'd also like to mention that the Software Sustainability Institute uh, in the UK has been an international leader in pushing uh, attention and drawing attention to the importance of high quality software. So this would be a good time to pause uh, if anyone has questions. Um, after this segment of the talk, I'll move in to talk a bit more about software ecosystem work that we've been doing. I, I don't see anything in the chat. Please uh, uh, write your questions in the chat if you have something. Okay, thanks. I'll just keep keep on going then. Uh, I have a question. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So, 
So I, I see in all this, um, uh, when you're organizing these teams, uh, I remember a course that I um, we had once uh, in Switzerland called Design Patterns by Eric Gamma. Um, so are mm -hmm. there particular recipes that people follow based on um, recipes like what uh, the book of Eric Hama or others are talking about? Are there particular patterns in the way you organize this uh, software yeah. or, or it is depending per, on, on the teams? That's a, that's a great question. And, and indeed, that, that was a, is a wonderful book. I've, I've enjoyed that myself. Uh, very impactful. I would say that uh, e each of the, the teams certainly incorporates elements of abstraction uh, and follows patterns such as in, in the, the book by Gamma and others. Uh, I, I would say there's, there's certainly no one size fits all approach to designing complex uh, scientific software. But uh, some of the principles as articulated in that book and others about good software design using object oriented or component based approaches to abstract away the, um, the key elements for, for interfaces from the details of the implementation. Uh, th those are key principles that, uh, that the teams generally use when, when trying to keep a handle on the complexity of the, the multiple layers of software. Uh, that would certainly be a, a good uh, deep dive conversation among many many people. <laughs> I think I'll get lots of lots of good answers uh, Thank you. From, from experienced developers. Sure. This slide uh, shows uh, kind of at a high level the the approach that we're taking in the Exascale Computing Project by incorporating work to improve the productivity of our development teams and also the sustainability of the resulting software. And really trying to change the culture of, of, our, of our community. Uh, and by our community, I really mean the computational science community in the large to, to focus on the importance of incorporating uh, robust software practices in, into what we're all doing so that we have uh, trustworthy software. Um, and I, I lead the project, the Ideas Productivity Project, uh, which is, is the project that's cross-cutting throughout the Exascale Computing Project to help teams uh, try to identify what some of their bottlenecks are and work to overcome and improve their practices so that they can have more effective uh, work going in the future so that they can work towards uh, so-called better, faster, cheaper, that is uh, achieving better science, having uh, more port portability and robustness and doing so with less time um, and uh, being more effective than in disseminating their work. So this is a cross-cutting element of work. Of course, we recognize that changing processes for what we do requires uh, time. So we just recognize that with investing some time in the beginning of our change um, will require uh, effort now, but will pay off over the longer term. So we're incorporating this philosophy across the Exascale Computing Project. Now I'm going to talk about work in software technology area to build a software stack that is building to complement what's already provided by computing vendors, um, but to provide high quality for what we need across the the landscape of these extreme scale science. Shown here are the six areas of the software technology portfolio. Uh, these span from low level programming models and runtimes through development tools, libraries for math, data visualization, and also elements of software ecosystem approaches. Uh, we're really grateful that these areas are led by incredibly talented people, uh, the so-called uh, level three leaders are shown here. And each of these areas has a, a variety of teams who are working on particular products. This slide shows the approach for the math library community within the Exascale Computing Project to coordinate across many distinct math libraries. Shown on the left, are the distinct libraries that are part of the current release of the, the Extreme Scale Scientific Software Development Kit, or XSDK. 
the central part of this slide shows how the approach of the XSDK is helping us to coordinate across these distinct and separate teams to incorporate their, their new advances in new algorithms, in new functionality, uh, advances in data structures and, and whatnot to help serve the needs of the application teams. Uh, as a point of history, in 2014, we began uh, an initial work on, on the XSDK. This was prior to the start of the Exascale Computing Project. Um, and I serve as, as a leader of, of the project uh, along with my career to begin that. And so what we found is that over time and over the years, we've been grateful that we've been able to expand from initially a few people who were funded to work to figure out how to overcome some challenges in the combined use of their software to now be a broad community effort uh, that welcomes participation from anyone who is interested. So we'll notice that in this list of, of current libraries participating on the left, um, there are some that are from the broader community, uh, people who are funded by the NSF or people in, in Europe who have chosen to want to participate as part of the, the XSDK because they believe it's, it's useful to them uh, to help work toward uh, overcoming challenges in, in the, the complementary use of, of different capabilities. So this slide shows the hierarchy of, uh, of functionality going from specific software products, which we, we've always had in our communities, through this topical grouping of uh, products or software development kits, uh, where teams are focusing on developing compatibility among their products where that makes sense functionally. And then to the higher level of the stack uh, where we're looking across the whole ecosystem. And this uh, we're, we're considering uh, as part of our work in developing an open uh, hierarchical e ecosystem uh, with, within the E4S um, endeavor. This is called the extreme scale scientific software stack. So this is a portfolio of, of functionality uh, across the, the whole uh, stack that I mentioned, where we're working together as teams to uh, enable individual projects to continue to have full flexibility to do their work in a way that makes sense, but we're providing this common uh, ability for, for people to be able to access documentation and releases in order to facilitate using the tools together in combination. So this work is led by Samir Shen at the University of Oregon uh, and builds on top of SAC, a very important technology that's helping to deal with portability and installation. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Lois? Yes. There is a question on the chat. I don't know if this is a good time to uh, bring it up. Sure, questions are welcome. Okay, uh, so the question reads, exascale refers to computer processing speed, but this measure diminishes the dependence of scientific applications on the data on which they depend. Will you be addressing the increased importance of data management for achieving high performance as well as instruction management, uh, the traditional focus of HCP, HPC? That's a great question. And I apologize for my coughing here. Um, certainly uh, data is becoming ever more important in the work that we're doing. And many of the teams in this project and otherwise are working on simulations that are a blend of both traditional modeling and simulation and use of extreme scale resources for uh, dealing with data analysis and, and whatnot. So I'll talk a little bit about that as one of our thrusts, uh, but my talk today won't delve into that deeply, but I certainly concur it's, it's quite important. So th this slide shows our approach of using community policies to help as our community 
come to common agreement on approaches that we believe are helping us to deal with complementarity among uh, software pro projects and products. So shown on the right is the list of community policies that have been determined for the E4S, uh, Extreme Scale Scientific Software Stack. And we are always looking for feedback on these policies. So I encourage any of you who have interest to take a look at them and um, think about whether they would be something that makes sense to you for the work that you do with your own software. Uh, and uh, if you have feedback, we, we'd love to hear, hear from you. But th these policies already have been quite helpful for our team. They'll say what motivated some of our work in the beginning of this project that predates CCP was we were trying to use in combination multiple libraries that were developed by different teams together to support subsurface modeling. And we were unable to proceed to do that due to a variety of um, elements where individual uh, software products did their work just fine, but didn't design their functionality in a way that was thinking about use in this broader context. So, so considering these policies has helped us overcome some of those barriers. Here's just a, a quick example of the impact that this combined use to uh, software is, is having on some of our application teams. The WDM app project is doing fusion modeling, whole device modeling, and is building on top of the build cache that's provided for our software products. This approach has enabled them as well as other applications to speed up their build time uh, by a, a factor of 10 or more. So now we'll talk a bit more about advancing practices for software productivity. As I've mentioned, we in the Exascale Computing Project are collaborating across teams who are focused on various aspects of applications and various aspects of software technologies. So we're really consider, considering ourselves to be a broad aggregate team. Uh, that brings together the combined talents of many people who have expertise in applied math, computer science, application areas, and more. And I'd say uh, what we're finding is that in a, in a collaboration of this uh, scale, that the importance of research software, enge software engineers is just cannot be overstated. And I would say that research software engineers are are, are incredibly important for what many, many computational teams do. Uh, so I would encourage those of you who are working on computational projects to, to think about whether, uh, if you don't already have uh, research-oriented software engineers on your teams, to think about uh, possibly in, incorporating some of them in the future, because they really can bring to the table strong expertise uh, across the scientific software spectrum. This slide provides a high level overview of the different elements of work that are proceeding within the ideas project that I mentioned earlier. This is a project that cross cuts up throughout the entire Exascale computing project uh, by working with teams to help to share information about software practices that teams can, uh, they can identify what, what some of their challenges are in software practices and, and work to improve them. Uh, and the, the ideas project has also been, um, been um, helping quite a bit to establish software communities uh, that are addressing some of the, the points that I just mentioned uh, and also are very strongly engaged in community outreach. This slide shows just some of the outreach that uh, this team has been doing. Um, and I mentioned this because some of you might be interested in some of these resources. Again, if you get access to the PDF file that I provided, uh, you could click on any of these underlined items to look for tutorial material um, or, or webinar information. We, for the last several years have been running a webinar series where we have a monthly webinar about uh, best practices for high-performance computing software developers. Uh, so there's a nice 
set of uh, resources available through the recordings of those webinars. And we invite you to uh, subscribe to our mailing list if you're interested in learning more about that. Uh, we've also been leading a panel series uh, that's been focusing on strategies for working remotely. And most recently had a session at Supercomputing 21 that is focusing on not just working remotely, but, build, but building sustainable approaches, recognizing that many of us will be working in hybrid mode uh, for, for many years to come. And in fact, uh, I would say that most most projects in computational science uh, have already always been in a hybrid mode. That is, we're not uh, consistently having our entire collaborating team co-located in person at one site, but rather we're collaborating across multiple teams. Uh, so this is an element uh, that, that our, our, our team is, is thinking about more and more and um, working towards strong long-term distributed collaboration. An element of, of outreach of our project is uh, the Better Scientific Software site. This slide shows a snapshot of, of what that looks like. This is intended as a community-based resource where, where people throughout the, the community uh, can share information on practices and approaches that they uh, have been using to improve the, the quality of their software, to improve their own software sustainability and productivity. So we invite you not only to, to, to read some of these if these kinds of topics interest you, but we're, we're always looking for contributors. So if you have some approaches to scientific software that uh, you would like to share with a community, we would welcome your contribution. Uh, and if you go to the site, you could find information on how to, how to contribute. Another outreach element that's very community oriented is the Better Scientific Software Fellowship Program. Uh, this slide shows the classes of fellows since inception in 2018 through our current fellowship year. This program recognizes uh, people who are doing great work to help change the culture of computational science to promote the uh, advance of practices in scientific software. So I encourage anyone who might be interested in, in learning about the work of these, these folks to, to take a look at the site. And also um, we certainly welcome applications uh, for next year. Application process will open in, in the summer for the 2023 year. An element of, of work in the Exascale Computing Project that I'm especially excited about, uh, that's our, our newest element, is the Broader Engagement Initiative. I am um, among the leadership team for this multi-pronged approach where we're working to expand the pipeline and workforce for high-performance computing through multi-pronged uh, initiatives. And we'll be beginning this summer by uh, hosting some uh, teams who visitors will be working as part of our Exascale Computing Project as hosted throughout the, the various labs who are involved. So if you're interested in, in more information about that, I encourage you to go to this website. And so finally, I'll work towards concluding um, some points for all of us to think about. I would say that each of us who's working on computational work, whether it's more applied math oriented or application oriented, really should think about the relationships of what we're doing with what other people are doing and think about software ecosystem perspectives. So what, what software, what ecosystems do we use, do we want to use? And, and likewise, which ones would we like our own software to be part of? Uh, I'll point out that the uh, the E4S, the Extreme Scale Scientific Software Stack, is an open architecture, extensible, and contributions and feedback are welcome. We have many contributors who are um, throughout the community. At the same time, I would encourage all of us to think about our own um, approaches to making sure our own software is high quality. Uh, 
there are a lot of wonderful resources developed by the groups shown here and, and many more. And uh, I, I encourage you to take a look and consider not only learning from the practices that these groups are communicating it about, but also encourage you to get, get involved in, uh, in contributing to some of these groups. Many of these are very open community organizations um, and recognize that as a community, as we do this, uh, it, it helps not only us as individuals, but helps the community as a whole. And so going back to thinking about our, our own individual relationships to, to software, I would just end, end with a few pointers. Uh, for, for those of us who develop and use software, there's some very specific actions we could take to help explicitly recognize that software quality is a critical component of our science and, and that we as a community must, must take action. So for individuals who are developing and using software, you could investigate resources for software improvement. You could advocate for and lead change in your projects, regardless of your role in the project. Even as a student, it's certainly possible to do these things. Uh, and then when you do, you can disseminate insights about what you've learned uh, through the various venues. And I would encourage you to learn more about the research software engineering movement. Um, lots of good good resources are available through, through the website for the US RSE Association and also others throughout the world. And for those of you who might lead projects or organizations where teams develop scientific software, I think it's, a, it's uh, an obligation to, to recognize that it's, it's necessary to devote time to continually develop and improve your software and to also provide clear career paths and mentoring for software professionals so that they can, can um, help, help all of us work toward high quality, trustworthy science. And for those people who may be stakeholders or supporters of, of projects that develop software, I think incorporating expectations of software quality is very important, including incorporating funding for people to do this work uh, too often. Uh, support for this is not explicit, but it's just um, happens kind of on the side as we're working towards our science goals or our math goals. Also incorporating expectation for transparency and reproducibility is very important. And all of us, of course, of course can work toward changes in software metrics, uh, career metrics, uh, and, and changes in incentives and education. The Exascale Computing Project is working to have broad dialogue about the future of scientific software. Every month we're hosting topical sessions that focus on leadership software, where we're, we're trying to work toward building community understanding about what, what is needed going forth for leadership software. Uh, the next session that's coming up is on April 21st. So for those of you who are interested, uh, we welcome you to, to attend. And um, if, if you'd be interested in speaking in a panel uh, for a forthcoming session, uh, please let us know. We we're, we're have recordings of the, the meetings that have been happening so far. We plan to continue these discussions as we're building a common understanding about the needs for scientific software. Uh, I'll just briefly transition into a, a, a slide about some work in Siam. I'm not sure uh, how many of you are members of the Society of Industrial Applied Mathematics, uh, but those of you are know that there's a variety of activity groups. And uh, it turns out there's, there's many, many different ones uh, according to specific elements of interest. What, what I'll mention is, is I'm currently serving as chair of the Siam Activity Group on Supercomputing and our, our, our officer team uh, just began its work in February, and we're, we're working toward a set of complementary initiatives that are intending to help raise awareness of opportunities in high-performance scientific software and uh, to, are working to, to grow the community. So any of you who might be interested in learning more, uh, feel free to let me know, and we'd, we'd love your involvement. Also, I'll just mention that Argonne and all of the other Department of Energy National Labs 
do provide many exciting career opportunities and also lots of opportunities for students and postdocs. So this slide here shows just a few at my own lab at Argonne, but uh, all the other labs, of course, have similar types of opportunities. So for the, those of you who might enjoy multidisciplinary computational science, um, certainly these, these labs and these opportunities are great places to, to explore. And that is all. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed speaking here and I would be glad to address any questions. Thank you, Lois. So uh, uh, Thank there you. are a couple of uh, questions uh, uh, on, on the chat. So let me uh, start with uh, those because uh, we did ask people to uh, post uh, questions on the chat. So the first one reads, we use the term ecosystem a lot without necessarily identifying ecosystem elements. What would you consider corresponds to persistent ecosystem niche in software systems? That's a great question. Uh, thinking about what, what elements of an ecosystem uh, make sense for that ecosystem. Is, is certainly an important uh, angle of consideration. Um, what I've been talking about here in terms of our, our software ecosystems uh, include considering uh, the software products that are providing a foundation um, for a layer of diverse applications, scientific applications, uh, and doing that in a way that uh, leverages our emerging computer architectures uh, while working with uh, the people, uh, while working by the people in order to, the collaborating teams in order to uh, achieve those science advances. So at some level, uh, at least in my own thinking, there's uh, important elements across all those, those areas of uh, both technologies, people, uh, machines, it's very complicated. I think that would be a good conversation to discuss uh, at a cafe over a cup of coffee. <laughs> okay, uh, and uh, there's another one uh, that uh, uh, reads as follows. How do you ensure interoperability and consistency across software products? That's a tough one, as you know, because uh, there are so many ways to, uh, to not be <laughs> interoperable and consistent. Um, and in fact, that those very challenges are, are what motivated uh, our, our team a number of years ago to begin working toward community policies to help ensure that we could identify the sort of the minimal set of elements that people needed to agree, to agree on in order to satisfy uh, that we would not be um, Causing conflicts among software that was developed independently but used in combination um, within the context of a single executable. So I would say um, I, th I think it's really important to have community dialogue to determine for a particular community what makes sense. I don't think any top-down approach will uh, necessarily be as successful as one that that involves uh, input from across the. the the people who are developing the software so that they can figure out what makes sense to them. Uh, and then of course, once that's done, robust and regular testing is essential in order to make sure that those uh, elements that do interoperate continue to function properly over time. So it's a, an ongoing process. Yeah, if I may add to this something, a uh, small uh, uh, variation on this theme perhaps, uh, to what extent uh, are, are these uh, software products uh, are modular that uh, are, are different parts or applications can be uh, inserted or do, even different methods for the same purpose can be inserted or uh, switched out? Modularity is, a, is quite an important concept. Certainly that's something that, that I would say most teams try to do when designing very carefully the interfaces that are exposed. Uh, and trying to separate that from underlying implementations. In, in our approach, uh, we have tried to pursue a, a, an element of 
uh, encouraging the development teams to determine for themselves where it makes sense to have that modularity and interoperability between uh, distinctly different software. Uh, for the case of math libraries, that's the one I'm most familiar with because I've spent my career developing math libraries. Uh, it, in, it, it's often very natural to interface between multiple software packages at the point of um, data elements, vectors or matrices, or, or actions on those, such as a linear system solve. And in some cases, that, that uh, definition of modularity is, um, is, is implemented and sustained. So we have a number of interoperable interactions among math libraries that have been sustained for many years. But of course, complexities uh, arise when we're especially looking at how we handle dealing with data operators, especially on heterogeneous architectures. So uh, becoming modular while also dealing with these changing data structures is very, uh, very challenging and something that I would say the whole community is, is still working on very hard. Okay. Uh, one uh, uh, more question from uh, uh, Petros, actually. Uh, so, the, uh, in fact, there's two questions here, so let me uh, read them out. Uh, uh, do you think that software developed within universities only uh, teams is a sustainable approach? Alternatively, how do labs incorporate the latest numeric innovations developed at universities? Well, there are many examples of outstanding software being developed at universities. And so uh, indeed, I think that is possible, but uh, there are of course challenges in um, working towards sustainable models, uh, given that the typical approach uh, at schools is for students to be there for a while and then move on to, to a different approach um, or different career, career opportunity. Um, certainly the, the what all of us do, whether we're at universities or at, or at research labs, we all need to be working on uh, research incorporating the latest, newest innovations. And so uh, it's very important, I think, to have uh, that research happening across our whole, um, our whole community, universities and research labs and industry, and then working to incorporate the, the you know, most effective elements in, into uh, the software. Certainly the, the, the teams at research labs uh, are actively working on research, uh, that they're, they're working on algorithmic research and whatnot. And many are partnering with university uh, partners as part of that work. Uh, and in, in, in many cases, university only people are, are developing sustainable scientific software. I mean, one great example of that that is, is in fact timely is uh, the latest Turing Award winner, Jack Tungera, who uh, is, is based at the University of Tennessee, is one of the collaborators in our uh, Exascale Computing Project. So he and his team, who are based at a university, are developing you know, really great software. A lot of their approach is to do exploratory research learning, and then many of their concepts and ideas are passed along to vendors who learn from them, and then use that to inform the work that they're doing uh, by the vendors to develop software libraries that are then supported by the vendors. So oftentimes these blended relationships can be beneficial for everyone. Okay. Uh, and one more uh, question on the chat. Uh, is there any work on analog quantum computing? Quantum co computing is a, a very exciting, important project for Department of Energy Labs, but it's not within the scope of the Exascale Computing Project. So um, there are no, no teams that, that I'm working with as part of this project that are doing that. But I encourage anyone who's interested to, to take a look. If you, if you search any of the, the Department of Energy uh, Lab websites, you can see quite a, a rich array of information <clears throat> about quantum. It's, it's certainly a growing, exciting area. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, I don't see any more uh, questions on the chat. Uh, so on this note, I'd like to thank our speaker again for a really wonderful presentation today. And I'd like to thank all those who participated and those who asked uh, questions. Thank you very much, Lois. It was really great to have you. Thank you. I've enjoyed being here and uh, 
getting a chance to meet all of you. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.